Good afternoon and welcome to the fall 2023 SWA group meeting general plenary session. And welcome to Chicago, city of my birth and of magnificent skylines and the world's best pizza. New York can just get stuffed, pun intended. Here are our speaker's disclosures for today's plenary. And here's our actual agenda. So I will begin with farewells and welcomes. Our first goodbye is much sadder than a simple group chair terming off. We want to humbly acknowledge Dr. David Alberts, who died on July 29th. Dr. Alberts was a major force within SWAG over several decades. He served as chair of our gynecologic cancers committee for 20 years from 1980 to 2000, and then was the committee's vice chair until it closed in 2010. He was also primary study chair on nine SWAG clinical trials. Over the years, Dr. Alberts became one of the most trusted advisors of then group chair Dr. Charles Coltman, contributing his wisdom and expertise to many of the critical leadership decisions made during Dr. Coltman's tenure. He also advised me directly many times during my early SWAG career. I touched here only on Dr. Alberts' contributions to SWAG's work. If you'd like to learn more about his many other accomplishments, there's a wonderful tribute to him posted on the University of Arizona Cancer Center website. Our next farewell is to Dr. Mark O'Rourke, who is retiring from his role as co-chair, an inaugural co-chair, of our Palliative and End-of-Life Care Committee. A pioneer in integrative oncology, Dr. O'Rourke was instrumental in bringing this committee to life within SWAG, and it's still the only palliative care committee in the NCTN. He's also been a member of our lung, gastrointestinal, cancer survivorship, and prevention and epidemiology committees. Dr. O'Rourke, we want to thank you for helping us make palliative and end-of-life care, the research committee, a reality, and thank you for continuing your work by staying on as a senior advisor. He could not join us today, but I would like to applaud him in absentia. Our next farewell is to senior biostatistician Bill Barlow, someone whose fingerprints are all over some of SWAG's most influential results of the last few decades. Dr. Barlow is planning to retire at the end of the year, and I've invited SWAG group statistician Mike LeBlanc to the podium to recognize and thank him. Thanks for coming, Mike. Thank you. Um, uh, it's a pleasure um, to be here, and uh, Bill and I were, were reminiscing a little bit before this, so um, Bill, I hope I don't mess this up. Um, um, I, I was told the last time I did this I got a little emotional, so I don't want to do that. Um, uh, Bill, um, Bill has been, um, uh, he's over the last several years, he's been uh, repeatedly bringing up the fact and preparing us for the fact he might be uh, transitioning onto other activities. And, and, and I fess up, I thought I was being clever by all talking about kids, international travel, you know, what we did on vacation and things like that, but the gig's up. So here it is, Bill. Um, he's, known, he's known to many of you as the breast cancer statistician, a cancer care delivery faculty statistician. Of course, reminded yesterday and the day before that he's also the SWOG biobanking statistician, that all those interactions with the NCI and the biobanking group. He's been a SWOG statistician since 2004, so about 20 years. Um, Bill's research is broad enough to cover several institutions. He's worked in SWOG and non-SWOG related activities at Cancer Research and Biostatistics. He's professor at Fred Hutch, where he's held multiple, he's been PI of multiple coordinating center grants, um, um, primarily related to screening, um, both in breast and other cancers, PROSPER studies, um, uh, and professor at the University of Washington. Next slide. Um, oh, the one thing I wanted to bring up about Bill is, uh, he does so many things. He's an expert at so many things. Um, some of us might be focused just on one aspect of clinical trials or some aspects of method, methodology. And so I'd refer Bill as the Renaissance guy, but I, I you know, I'm not a, a, I don't have great command of the English language, and I was looking up polymath. Polymath actually means something pretty similar. Um, and it's even better because it's got math in the title, and both of Bill's skills have, have math. So I'm gonna call Bill a statistical polymath. He is an expert in the design and conduct of breast therapeutic trials. He's done it through the SWOG Cancer Research Network. 
uh, NCI committees, and other international cancer uh, collaborations. He's an expert in screening studies and, and uh, a, as I said, a PI of Statistical Coordinating Center for Breast Cancer a Surveillance Consortium, a PI of a coordinating center called PROSPER, which is an NCI-funded initiative that looked at breast, colorectal, cervical, and lung cancer, and has over 100 publications in breast cancer research. He's an expert in statistical modeling and risk prediction models, case cohort designs, risk prediction models, as I said, on statistical aspects of translational medicine studies. Um, he's an excellent teacher and mentor, a teacher for us at the Statistical Center, but also traditional teaching awards at UW, and a teacher at our uh, early stage investigator course, and, and, uh, and, and ones that, uh, that students look to all the time. Um, I, an excellent, even with us at the Statistical Center, recently he took Joe Unger and myself through an analysis that we were kind of confused of what we should do next, and Bill kind of sorted it out for us to, to think of what's going on. He's an expert in research outside of cancer, ophthalmology, vaccines, efficacy, and back pain. And what I really wanted to bring up were, I mean, that's all quantitative stuff, that's all analytic stuff, um, but the, and the other key words are maybe more qualitative. He's collaborative, he's innovative, he's high principled, and um, you know, we have our Canadian roots, so I'll say we're both modest, and I think that's an important part to make all the other stuff work. You gotta be good, but modesty helps you take a long way. So, next slide. So, I'm a statistician, Bill's a statistician, so sometimes, uh, sometimes data are useful. Um, so I'll take as a case study, uh, SWOG 1007. There's probably several in the people in the room uh, that are familiar with this study called RX Bonder. Um, I recently learned that Bill actually gave it its name I always wondered at the, at the statistical center, we always, some of us just don't like names, but I realized Bill was always for names because he came up with the best name of any trial we had so far. Um, and I went through the protocol and the publication recently in preparation for this again. Um, and what was special about it, it really was a novel integral biomarker design. I mean, really key to the protocol, this large randomized study. I should mention, um, even though it's not the point of talking about it, it was a randomized phase three study, and Bill can correct me or others, it, that looked at endocrine therapy versus chemoendocrine therapy um, and HER2 positive uh, women, nodes, one to three nodes, right? And, and it showed among, at, at the end, it showed among prepenopausal women that chemotherapy was actually beneficial and postmenopausal women in this category that endocrine therapy was sufficient. Did I get it? Bill? Okay, okay. I was so close. I'm a lymphoma guy, breast cancer, okay. Anyway, but let's get back to the statistics because I think that's important and I don't want to take too long, Dr. Blanke, but uh, it's, it's built on, it was built on prior research on the recurrence score that Bill and Dr. Albane and others had worked on. So it had, it had sort of formulated from prior research there. It was an exceptional, and I get goosebumps as a statistician, this is the really good part. The statistical design protocol include graphs, and that picture showed graphs of what Bill postulated the effect might be in the study. Formulas, he, not only did he show the formulas that ca calculated the variances, he told us how he derived them in the, in the, in the thing, and using a delta method would be still my heart as a statistician. He was doing Taylor series expansions to get those results. Um, and then on top of it, Everybody talks about simulations and synthetic data. Well, Bill was doing this 10 years ago in designing this complex study so we could understand what was going on. Um, it's not just about analyses here, it's also about taking this study through to completion. And um, I had to give a presentation this morning to the SWOG DSMC about something minor. Um, and Dr. Tang and always, you know, tries to get me over because I'm a nervous talker. Um, but you just channel Bill, because Bill, Bill's the guy. So, um, so he, he's taken, he took this study through multiple complex discussions, the Data and Safety Monitoring Committee, um, and always anticipated what would happen in the future. And I thought that was referenced in the paper because the word pre-specified appears six times in that paper, um, sort of, uh, and it's the whole notion of understanding statistics is designing for it in the future, and Bill was this, labeling the fact that that was, that was part of what they'd anticipated. And the result is clinical trial, uh, convincing trial results. So I just really wanna thank Bill for all of his contributions um, to SWOG and more broadly. Um, 
and his in his in his modesty i think there could have been multiple places in here you could have called it the barlow strategy or the barlow statistic um but um the the, the last slide is maybe my joke slide of the work bill bill comes from a line of people who maybe not be as quite as uh, modest as he is next slide so and, and talking to bill in fact his grandfather was a prospector um, and apparently less modest than Bill, because if you look at a map of Alaska and the Yukon, there's a big mountain called Barlow Mountain, so he should have named some of those statistics. Actually, there's a Barlow town and a Barlow lake, too, um, but they don't show up on this map. So again, now I'm going to get emotional. Bill, thank you for everything you've done, and uh, as you've done for SWOG and Stat Center, and you're not leaving anyway. You're our senior statistician and consultant forever. Thank you. Of course, we want to again thank Dr. Barlow for his many contributions. Hand it to him, and I'll oh, stand yeah. here. Okay. Oh, gotta, you gotta hold it too, or do something. Okay. Close it up. Thanks a lot. Thank you, both. Thank you. All right, that was nice. And now, a goodbye to another SWAG giant, someone I personally have been in awe of what seems like two and a half decades. Dr. Ian Thompson served as chair of our genital urinary Com committee for 14 years. It was a tenure of enormous progress and change, and he just stepped down this past summer. Our GU vice chair, Dr. Daniel Petrolak, will join us to just touch upon our appreciation for Dr. Thompson. Thank you for coming up. Thank you, Dr. Blanke. So, Ian, thank you. This has been a pleasure to work with you all these years. Hard to believe it's now more than 30 when I first joined SWAG in 1991. But uh, we, we all appreciate all that you've done for us. But, you know, as Bill Parcells says, you're as good as your record. And this is the record for Ian. And the, the record is actually spectacular. He served 15 years as the GU, ch GU chair. He also served as the localized prostate cancer chair for a period of time. But during his tenure as GU chair, there were 613 patients placed on SWOG trials. And he was co-author on 52 papers, including those in JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, Journal of Clinical Oncology, to name a few. 72 abstracts that were pre pre presented at professional meetings. And he led really two very, very pivotal trials, the PCPT, which was the prostate cancer prevention, prevention trial, which looked at finasteride as a preventative agent, and also the SELECT trial, which looked at nutritional supplementation as a preventative agent for prostate cancer. These are some of the, the major phase three trials that were reported under Dr. Thompson's leadership. There was SWAG 1011, which is looking at lymphadenectomy uh, in patients with uh, uh, locally advanced bladder cancer, looking at adjuvant radiation therapy for pathologic T3 disease, Furthering on the docetaxel data, which, which SWOG helped to pioneer, docetaxel combined with atrocetin versus docetaxel in castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Intravesical studies looking at gemcitabine, uh, Everest, uh, looking at uh, uh, enverolimus after surgery for renal cell carcinoma. Intermittent hormone therapy for androgen deprivation uh, in prostate cancer. Some important observations were made out of this trial, including looking at PSA nadirs and how this could potentially be used as a clinical endpoint. And then finally, the Arental trial in metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. The trend now is moving these agents up front in hormone-sensitive disease, trying to see if we can improve survival in our patients. I think some of the important caveats that have come from the PCPT trial that, that Ian has helped, helped to lead is looking at finasteride, which did reduce the risk of prostate cancer the question, of course, is did we see more high-grade prostate cancer because of this? And then a risk calculator was also uh, generated from this particular trial, and it confirmed what a lot of us knew for a long time, what the risk of prostate cancer was in a patient who had a PSA of less than four. It's been validated in a number of international cohorts of, of patients and is related also to numerous pu publications. Uh, unfortunately, finasteride did not reduce, or actually fortunately didn't reduce the long-term survival in prostate cancer. But when we're looking at risk factors, it's critical to also look at socio-demographic factors, and Ian was a leader in looking at these, uh, was well ahead of our time in thinking of these particular concepts. What about Ian as a team leader? Well, I, I, I can't say enough positive things about Ian in that respect. 
He's always fostered the idea of team science and actually came up this morning in the Vogelsang Symposium. Each person on a study team was a key contributor and the pressing goal was to answer the question with the best possible science with everybody contributing their part from various disciplines. Surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, lab scientists, statisticians, pathologists, all these individuals were equally involved, important members of the team, and led to an environment of inclusiveness and respect in GU cancers. And he's always hands-on, and that reflected his passion for research and his passion for patient care. He regularly asked those around us, are you training your replacement? emphasizing that all of us were replaceable and that we need to share our information with the next generation. Ian also looked for opportunities to identify leaders amongst programs that might be traditionally overlooked. We've had members go to other committees, particularly developmental therapeutics and other committees, radiology, to help bring the, their, their expertise back to the GU committee. And they were not only selected for their leadership roles, but it also selected them up for success as well. And this is a picture of Dr. Vogelzang and Dr. Thompson, our leadership team for a long period of time. Let me go back one. What really impressed me about Ian is something that happened last year. We were all very touched by this. Ian called me up one evening, said, Nick is sick. Um, we don't know how long he's going to live. Let's go see him. And I, th there could not have been no nothing more appropriate to do for a colleague. We, we all love Nick Vogelzang, and we all love the, the, the love that was seen in the group for, for all of us. And this is one of the things that, that Ian has really perpetuated. We're family. We all work together well. We all play together well after the meeting was over with. And uh, this was really a special afternoon. I was really privileged to be a part of that. And we have Ian to thank for organizing it. And I know Nick appreciated that as well. So to, to conclude, I think one of the most unlikely presentations of any uh, clinical trial happened on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. And let's see if this will work here. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. No, it's got to work. It's got to work. Can you guys make it work? I, I, I know I embedded it. And the University Here. Here of go. Texas have found that a drug, a drug that treats male pattern baldness, can also be used to reduce the risk of prostate cancer. The only drawback, you now grow hair on your prostate. That's the only bad thing. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're saying. That's a bad comb over, isn't it? <laughs> and the, uh, let's let that visual picture set in there for just a minute. We've got that all in our minds. A couple's out there making love going, uh, never mind. Anyway, thank you, Ian. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> so we are especially going to thank Dr. Thompson for sharing his best practices, which have just filtered throughout all our committees. All right, I want to hold the plaque for the picture. Wait, wait, can you get the picture? I want to be in this picture too. Throw that plaque. Excellent. Thank you, guys. It's a new metric for cl clinical trials. Make it for the Tonight Show. <laughs> Better than the ethical plenary. All right, our final farewell today is to yet another SWAG giant, the outgoing chair of our patient advocate committee, Rick Bangs, and I'm going to take this one myself. Mr. Bangs is a survivor of several neoplasms, including bladder cancer. He refers back to his experiences as a patient when he talks about why he became involved in advocacy, saying that he promised himself something good would come of all this. Rick has kept that promise, and much good has come of what resulted. He was named as our bladder cancer advocate in 2009. His enthusiasm, energy, and commitment convinced his fellow advocates to select him as chair of their group in 2011. In the spring of 2013, our Board of Governors voted to promote them to full committee status, and we formalized Rick's appointment as committee chair. In the 15 years since the 2008 reestablishment of our advocate program, the role of the patient advocate within SWAG has become thoroughly professionalized thanks to Rick. Advocates have been fully integrated into the group's selection, design, and development of our studies. Many individuals have contributed to the progress, but no one else has come close to Mr. Bangs. He led our first orientation session for new advocates in 2011 and was a primary contributor to the development of our patient advocate orientation handbook. He was also a key driver of the push to have a patient advocate present and contribute on all triage calls, 
when new trial concepts are formally evaluated. Patient advocate input since has dramatically improved the quality of SWOG studies. Today, all triage presentations include a formal review by one or more advocates, again, thanks to Rick. Advocacy Vice Chair Hildy Dillon is a standing and a now invaluable member of our Executive Review Committee. Rick was co-lead on the PCORI funded project that developed the Team Science at SWOG program, which fully integrates patient advocates into clinical research across the NCTN groups. More recently, he was project lead on Team Science at SWOG Module 6, which makes our clinical trial participants more representative of patient populations overall. His commitment there into a more equitable SWOG is second to none, and he remains to this day one of the leaders of SWOG's DEI efforts. He has served on several NCI steering committees, been chair of the Patient Advocate Steering Committee, and he's an active member of the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. The NCI and advocates nationwide look to Rick regularly for new training ideas. He has improved NCTN operations in far too many ways to count, and I'm sure he'll continue his advocacy work in these and other forums. It's going to be difficult to imagine not having him as a regular participant, contributor, and moral voice in SWAG leadership meetings, where I've come to rely on his thoughtfulness, insight, and perspectives. His tenure as Advocate Committee Chair ends Monday, but I am happy to announce Rick will remain part of SWAG in an emeritus role. So, Mr. Bangs, please join me on stage. The words thank you do not touch upon our appreciation, but thank you for joining me. Oh. You gotta swap your chair. Get back with you. <laughs> Okay. No, no, yeah. Yes? So do it. So I just want to thank all of you for what is the most rewarding work of my life. The patient advocates here are unbelievably amazing and you have embraced them in ways that we could not have imagined in some of those pictures back there. So I just want to thank everybody and look forward to future success for all of you. And now I'm going to gasp, break with tradition for a moment. We don't always call retiring committee vice chairs up to the podium at plenary, but our patient advocate committee vice chair, Hildy Dillon, has been a contributor in the ways I just outlined for years in that Monday triage meeting. As we noted, she has played a particularly valuable role, more like an executive officer, really, in reviewing proposals for all SWAG new trials. So, Ms. Dillon, please join me on stage. I really want to thank you for your commitment and clear-headed advocacy. All right, farewell is completed. We can move on to welcoming new leadership. Our first welcome goes to Dr. Chul Su Ha, the new chair of our Radiation Oncology Committee. A longtime member of SWAG, Dr. Ha directs radiation oncology trials at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio Mays Cancer Center. He is remarkably passionate about the possibilities for his committee, and he has many exciting ideas for new directions. He takes the reins from interim chair, Dr. James Yu. So I want to thank Dr. Yu and welcome Dr. Ha. <laughs> Having just said thank you and goodbye to Dr. Ian Thompson for his service, we now welcome our new GU chair, Dr. Seth P. Lerner. Seth jumped into the role immediately, attending our strategic planning meeting shortly after I offered him the new appointment. Dr. Lerner is the Beth and Dave Swalm Chair in Urologic Oncology at Baylor College of Medicine. He has long served the GU committee with distinction as organ site chair for localized bladder cancer, and I expect equal distinction during his tenure as leader of all SWAG research in GU cancers. Dr. Lerner, I want to thank you for your past service to SWAG and welcome you to your future service and new role. Our final welcome in this plenary is to a pair of incoming leaders. This summer, we asked for applications for both chair and vice chair positions on our patient advocate committee. Candidates Anne Marie Mercurio and Dr. Barbara Segarra, perhaps taking inspiration from Drs. Hirschman and Lara, put themselves forward for consideration as equal co-chairs of the committee. Their rationale for shared leadership and the candidate pairing made sense. So I'm delighted to welcome them as new co-chairs of SWAG's patient advocacy committee 
as of next Monday. Ms. Mercurio has served as advocate with our Digital Engagement Committee from its founding and is a true pioneer in conducting effective patient advocacy in the realm of social media. Dr. Segarra is professor at the University of Puerto Rico Medical Science Campus. She's been a patient advocate with our Cancer Care Delivery Committee, as well as a tireless proponent of making our trials more diverse and more inclusive. Dr. Segarra and Ms. Mercurio, welcome as our new Patient Advocate Committee co-chairs. All right, time to move on to SWOG news and accomplishments. Our lead story is about our applications for the next major round of SWAG's federally funded grants. All of us had expected the NCI would put forward the applications for the next cycle of operations and statistics and data management this fall. But as most of you have probably heard by now, the NCI is postponing the application process for the next cycle for a number of its operational, statistical, imaging, and TM-related grants, and the NCOR Research Base Award as well by some six to 12 months. To keep us going, the good news is they will extend funding by one year. So this poses an interesting dilemma for SWAG, not to be confused with one of my amusing anecdotes. The term served by our group chair is supposed to be synchronized with the grant cycle by our constitution, but it's limited in maximum time. My second term as chair began with the start of SWAG's current NCTN grant, and it was slated to end after six years and with the expiration of that grant, but that end date is now further out than anticipated. In addition, as you know, our Board of Governors has already elected my successors, Drs. Don Hirschman and Primo Lara. We had all planned the formal start of their terms as group co-chairs would be just after the close of the spring 2025 group meeting. Now moving our major grants at the very end of an old cycle, rather than with the start of a brand new fresh one, doesn't seem like the world's brightest idea. After much discussion and extensive consultation with SWAG's Executive Advisory Committee, Drs. Lara, Hirschman, and I proposed a group chair term continue to be tied to the grant cycle as is required by our bylaws. But this grant cycle is being extended by as much as a year, so we propose the current chair's term, mine, be extended accordingly. The terms of Dr. Lara and Hirschman as co-chairs elect would also be extended. We believe this approach is fully in line with the intention of SWAG's bylaws and tomorrow we will formally present this proposal to the Board of Governors. After Saturday, Drs. Hirschman, Lara, and I have a definitive plan for how we will move forward together. We will certainly share SWAG's highest level decision making, particularly for terms that will carry forward, or items that will carry forward into their term. So this postponement of the grant renewal process comes with huge opportunities for SWAG. We have an additional year or so to strengthen our next application. You all know a key measure for reviewers of our eventual NCTN grant application is our accrual. Now enrollment numbers vary year by year, and in 2022 the number of studies opened and total SWAG accrual were down, mostly because of the normal trial life cycle. Our science remained at the head of the NCTN. Now we've already opened 10 new studies this year, and studies like Pragmatica Lung well, it's going gangbusters, as we hoped and, dare I say, predicted. So I remain incredibly optimistic for the next cycle, especially with the extra accrual that comes with the additional time. But please, please continue to do what you do so well. Offer your patients opportunities to participate in NCTN research, hopefully through SWAG. Speaking of NCI surprises, we hope to be able to release official words soon on the status of the several outstanding proposals SWAG submitted for the first round of trials to be conducted within the, within the NCI's new Clinical Trials Innovation Unit. Please stay tuned. Now, as for those accomplishments, SWAG researchers publish papers or abstracts on our work at the rate of about three per week. Thus, the headlines shown here are just a few examples of SWAG's high-impact work, trials that caught the attention of media outlets in recent months. So we have the results of our S1826 trial led by Dr. Alex Herrera, which garnered a plenary shot at ASCO this summer. Totally amazing. More importantly, the results are changing practice in the treatment of advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma. Dr. Seth Lerner presented results from S1011, which seemed to defin definitively answer the question of whether patients with localized muscle invasive bladder cancer should get an extended rather than a standard lymphadenectomy at time of surgery. The answer, by the way, seems to be no. Dr. Meghna Trivedi presented findings from patients with breast cancer 
as part of the treasure trove of data her team has collected during the S1714 study. She was investigating our patient's experience with peripheral neuropathy after treatment with taxanes. Dr. Megan Oath has presented an analysis showing a linear relationship between change in tumor size and overall survival times in patients on the S1609 DART trial. There was no evidence that threshold effects aligned with resist response categories. In a truly first of its kind study, Dr. Robert Krauss published S1316 results. These showed surgery for malignant bowel obstruction may not help patients with advanced cancer live longer, but it is likely to help them live better. Although adjuvant everolimus did not help the overall population of S0931 patients with renal cell carcinoma, it did show a benefit in the subgroup of patients at the very highest risk level. Dr. Christopher Ryan, executive officer, led the team that published results in Lancet this summer. Finally, a team led by Dr. Riha Vedya published an analysis of the patients enrolled in the lung map trial, showing that umbrella study accrued patients from certain underrepresented groups at a higher rate than conventional trials in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Remember, these are only about one-tenth of the SWOG papers and presentations that came out since the spring group meeting. You can find the full set in the publications database, also accessible in our new publications dashboards, both linked from our website. Let's give all those investigators a hand. <laughs> SWOG's work to make our membership, leadership, and trials more diverse, equitable, and inclusive continues full steam ahead. I hope you caught our DEI town hall event yesterday and learned more about those efforts and why they matter. And that you had a chance to connect with our LGBTQ plus and AYA community advocates at last evening's networking event. Our membership profiles project is also progressing, and phase two will be open soon for user testing and feedback. Another shout out to Rick Bangs for leading this effort. Its importance cannot be overstated. We want to ensure that all feel included in our efforts, and we can only do it by understanding who SWOG is. Dr. Patricia Robinson is transitioning from DEI fellow to special advisor to DEII vice chair, Dr. Don Dizan. She'll be working on a DEI checklist for study chairs to use throughout protocol development. She's also leading an effort to allow sites to easily renew their own enrollment in terms of representation. Of course, you'll hear from Dr. Robinson directly in mere moments. An NCORE-wide effort is underway to enhance the collection of sociodemographic data so all the groups can do it uniformly. The NCI plans to advise us further on the best means of harmonization. Finally, congratulations to DEI champion Dr. Manuel Espinoza, who's part of the 2023 cohort of the Robert A. Wynn Diversity and Clinical Trials Career Development Award. This comes in support of his work on the Multiple Myeloma Protocol 2209. I also want to give a shout out to Dr. Sikander Ilawadi, who will be his primary mentor. The next Wynn CDA application opens January 3rd, and Dr. Dizan is happy to assist. Clinical Trials, SWAG's Clinical Trials Partnerships, or CTP, is how we partner with industry to conduct clinical trials. These can be within our preferred partnerships program, multi-arm trials typically built on pipeline access, or they can be trials initiated by SWAG committees, which can evolve into broader partnerships. Under the leadership of Dr. Kathy Elbane, CTP has numerous projects in the works, three of which are now nearing the final stages of contract and development and hopefully activation. They are all phase two studies and are all expected to be fully funded by industry. These include a study in first-line muscle invasive bladder cancer led by Dr. Joshua Meeks, a trial in recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer with Dr. Paul Swazicki as study chair, and a study in patients with newly diagnosed Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL led by Drs. Anjali Advani and Michaela Leidke. The CTP staff has also made great strides in building the infrastructure needed for data capture and clinical trial management such as an electronic trial master file system built on the Florence platform. They've put into place systems for electronic data capture, IRB review, site funding and contracts, and much, much more. As their studies approach activation, CTP will reach out to all sites to assess feasibility and select participating institutions. Again, please stay tuned. If you didn't catch the CTP update forum live on Wednesday, watch for the recording, which will be posted to the SWAG website in the coming days. Again, you can learn how your site can participate in upcoming CTP trials and about other projects in development. The CTP website and contact information are shown here on the slide. Your ideas are always welcome. 
Now a fun part, more fun. I get to congratulate our top accruing sites for the first half of 2023, January through June. Among main members in LAPS, our leading accruers were University of Colorado Cancer Center, Dr. Anthony Elias, PI, Leahy Hospital and Medical Center, Dr. Paul Hesketh, PI, University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center, Dr. Christopher Lau, PI, Massachusetts Veterans Epidemiology Research and Information Center, or Maverick, the first consortium of Veterans Affairs Medical Centers to appear on this list, Dr. Mary Brothy, PI, and the University of Southern California Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, Dr. Heinz Joseph Lenz, PI. Among our sites in the NCI Community Oncology Research Program, our top enrollers were Heartland Cancer Research NCOR, Dr. Brian Fowler, PI, University of Kansas Cancer Center Masonic Center Alliance Rural Minority Underserved NCOR, Dr. Priyanka Sharma, PI, Kaiser Permanente, NCOR, Dr. Jennifer Suga, PI, Carl Cancer Center, NCOR, Dr. Kendrith Rowland, Jr., PI, and Cancer Research of Wisconsin and Northern Michigan Consortium, Dr. Jonathan Treisman, PI. I truly think enthusiastic applause is in order for all of these sites. In a teeny teaser and on a related note, we had a stellar quality assurance meeting on Wednesday. We in SWAG are poised to track and recognize at this forum a new institutional performance metric which will seriously improve the quality of our research. Please stay tuned for spring of 2024. And now we will move to the closer, at least, to the crux of the plenary, starting with recent research awards from HOPE programs. The most recent SWAG Early Exploration and Development Fund Awards goes to doctors Celine Jones and Evan Hall, both of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center for their seed fund proposal, creating recommendations for analysis of patient reported outcomes in oncology trials. Doctors Jones and Hall, congratulations. <laughs> the NCOR pilot grant is awarded for projects aimed at increasing the participation of underrepresented populations in clinical trials. HOPE has just announced our fourth NCOR pilot award to Dr. Mark Fiala of Washington University for the project using recruitment messages through electronic medical record patient portals to improve enrollment into clinical trials among people with cancer. Congratulations, Dr. Fiala. <laughs> now, you all know the HOPE Foundation celebrates its 30th anniversary this year under the theme, A Generation of Impact. Looking at the foundation's past, but also to its future, our plenary today features many generations of hope. Our first presenter is Dr. Virginia Sun, SWAG's Executive Officer for Research on Palliative and End-of-Life Care and Cancer Survivorship. Dr. Sun is an Associate Professor of Nursing Research and Education in the Department of Population Sciences and Surgery at City of Hope. She's also the study chair for S1820, a trial that benefited from several forms of hope support and which is the subject of her presentation today. Dr. Sun. Thank you, Dr. Blanke, and it's wonderful to be back with my SWOG and HOPE Foundation family. It's really an honor to share my story today, um, and here we go. So the story really begins in 2015, and I have been at that time working with Dr. Robert Krauss, who is the co-chair of the Palliative End of Life Committee for many years outside of the SWOG and NCORP arena. And one day he said to me, Virginia, come join SWAG. It's great. <laughs> and um, with those words, I started attending SWAG meeting, applied for investigator um, status through City of Hope, my home institution. And at that time, I was working with Dr. Krauss using um, his R01 funded projects outside of the SWAG arena to look at dietary and behavioral adjustments for survivors of rectal cancer and the um, quality of life impact of bowel dysfunction has um, for our survivors. And we found that there is a need to create interventions because there are very few evidence-based interventions. And we knew that, we found out that many of our survivors are struggling with maintaining bowel control. And all of these um, symptoms are impacting their social activities, their um, social well-being, and their quality of life. We also found that our survivors told us the dietary adjustment was often used as a self-management strategy, but they often received minimal support. So we took this knowledge and I came to SWOG and the first um, thing that I did was, as a nurse scientist, I joined the nursing research subcommittee led, to doc led by Dr. Jamie Myers 
and I am still a proud member. The committee is doing very um, many very important work, and I'm so happy to be a part of that group. So we took this idea of finding ways to improve bowel dysfunction management, and I brought it to the Cancer Survivors Committee initially. Dr. Krauss was the um, co-chair at that point for that committee. And we worked together to uh, work, uh, work on a diet modification intervention for bowel symptom management. And one of the things we wanted to try within the NCORP um, infrastructure is this in centralized intervention delivery by telephone approach as a way to minimize site burden, but also be able to scientifically maintain intervention fidelity. So with Dr. Krause's support, I am so, I was, um, I applied for and was selected to attend the 2016 early stage investigator training course in Seattle. I showed up in Seattle and um, Dr. Kathy Crew flew all the way from New York City to be my primary mentor and, um, and so really attended the two and a half day course. And one of the main activities at the end of the two, day, two and a half day course was the ability for each of the attendees to present their concept, what they have been working on um, at the end of the day. And um, I want to give Dr. Mike LeBlanc credit. I vividly remember the very last thing that I heard from everyone and you was, go get preliminary funding. Go apply for seed fund. So, um, so we actually did that. And um, that was our first support through the Folk Foundation. I was able to secure a SWAG Early Exploration and Development Seed Fund Award that we completed between 20, 2017 and 2018. We did this as a single group, single site pilot um, trial of the Alterant Intake Managing Symptoms or AIMS intervention, which is the name of our intervention. Um, we enrolled City of Hope participants, but we also tested this process of the feasibility of doing centralized interventions um, at a different location. I was very honored to partner with Dr. Cindy Thompson, who um, leads a very um, well-known core in terms of behavioral medicine, behavioral intervention approach at University of Arizona, and also Dr. Tracy Crane, who was at the University of Arizona at that time. She is now at Sylvester Cancer Center at the University of Miami, and they are co-chairs on um, S1820 as well as Dr. Krause. And so we tested this process of enrolling participants at City of Hope and having the interventionist be at University of Arizona and delivering the intervention um, from Arizona. And one of the things that we um, collected as part of our pilot study, and I wanted to really share this with everyone because these are um, participants' words. We did exit interviews with all of our 10 participants, and this really helped give us a signal in terms of the fact that we are on the right track. Our participants, um, found derived benefits in terms of this health coaching intervention for bowel symptom management. Um, they were happy to hear the support, happy to hear the, inf the information. They found many of the processes we developed within the intervention to be helpful. They um, completed the food and symptom diary, for example, to help them understand the relationship between what they ate and their bowel symptoms. So we took that information and we also knew that we needed funding, just like many of the NCORP trials, we need additional funding to support our intervention. So I went ahead and applied um, as part of the executive committee or triage review. We um, applied for a SWAG trial support STRS fund and um, was able to secure two years of support from STRS. The um, S1820 was officially approved on March 19, 2018 as part of the triage approval process. And the funding supported our interventionists that were located at University of Arizona, which you could not have been able to do this trial without the support. I also at the same time applied and was accepted to attend the grant writing workshop supported by the Hope Foundation and led by Dr. Kathy Crew. I think I um, was able to use two different <laughs> proposals through the um, writing workshop process to get feedback and was able to really have reviewers provide really good feedback and make revisions to these two grants. And so we subsequently submitted NCIR 21 to support S1820 and we were able to receive funding um, with the feedback from the grant writing workshop with the first initial submission. So we received our NOA, our notice of award, on February 1st, 2019. And I also do want to share that I also, um, at the same time, submitted an R01 grant 
um, as for part of the writing workshop to provide feedback. And that trial is outside of SWAG, but that one was also funded as well. So thank you, Dr. Crew, and to the um, virtual grant writing workshop. And so this is the result. This is our SWAG S1820 trial. We have completed accrual, but this is um, just a schema for the study where we um, tested a two-arm randomized trial. This is a preliminary efficacy trial um, comparing intervention arm. We had um, the intervention called AIMS RC, so um, altering intake managing symptoms for rectal cancer, and also the attention control arm as um, healthy living condition. And we were supported um, throughout the um, study implementation by the Hope Foundation's STRS Clinical Trial Support Fund in the R21. And along the way, I really want to thank many of the people, wonderful people that I've met and, and worked with in terms of the support of the S1820. We all know that all of our protocols is really a teamwork um, approach. So just many thanks to everybody um, involved in the process. Many thanks to the GI committee um, for giving me the opportunity to have a few minutes in the past years to present the um, protocol. And, and we are, you know, I'm sure it, it really was helpful in terms of accrual overall. So just a little bit of information in, term, in terms of trial accrual. Um, we did open our accrual on December 9th, 2019, and we closed to randomization on April 28th, 2022. So we were able to uh, complete accrual in a timely fashion. Um, we had 39 NCORP and NCTN member institutions participate, and 30 of them in the community and nine academic. And we are very proud to say that we were able to enroll participants in Guam. So many thanks to... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this telephone approach, you know, and we learned a lot through the process in terms of the need to be able to make that happen. So many thanks to our colleagues and collaborators at the Hawaii Minority NCORP for helping us with that. We enrolled overall 117 participants and randomized 93 participants. So this is actually my final slide. And so just a really quick milestone um, and, and all the support that HOPE provided in yellow. As, you, as we all know, there are many steps in the review process and approval process. And as you can see here, S1820 would not be around, it would not be possible without HOPE support. And I also just want to add my, I have personally, professionally, you know, HOPE has contributed to my professional development as well. I'm happy to share that seven years since I first started um, at SWAG, I am now a full professor at City of HOPE in the Department of Population Sciences and Department of Surgery. So thank you so much for the impact. Um, and I do want to, in conclusion, I was reflecting on the presentation earlier today and, and wanted to quote Dr. Don Dizon from yesterday's um, town hall that, um, that we all belong. We all belong to this group and we all have something to contribute to this amazing infrastructure and this amazing group. And thank you so much to Hope Foundation, really helping me to feel that belong, that I belong here, that I can contribute. And, Finally, I want to thank Dr. Blanke, Dr. Hirschman, and Dr. Lara. I, have now, I now have the immense privilege and honor to give back to the, to the group and to the membership as an executive officer. So thank you so much. We're gonna see how it goes timing-wise. We might have a little time at the very end for the entire panel after everybody's spoken. So uh, Stephen Bartlett of the Rocky Mountain VA Medical Center chairs our VA committee and led the working group that preceded it. He's here today to present on the remarkable impact of 10 years of HOPE support in helping our veterans access NCI-sponsored trials, not only at SWAG, but across the entire network. Mr. Bartlett, the podium is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm happy to here to talk to you about uh, us re-engaging VA in the NCTN and bringing clinical trials to veterans across the country. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. I have no disclosures. I work for the federal government, so. Um, so a brief history, and, and I'm old enough to remember this. Once upon a time, the VA was a very significant contributor and partner with uh, the NCI Cooperative Group Program back when we had a billion different cooperative groups and, and it wasn't the, the four that we have now. 
Uh, but over time, several issues eroded that participation. Uh, the VA in introduced strict HIPAA, HIPAA implementation, and there was a lot of folks in privacy offices that really didn't know how to approach that. Uh, through some data breaches, lost laptops, and things like that, the VA instituted some really draconian security efforts that prevented us from working on a lot of different IT platforms. Uh, and then the NCI requirement to uh, have to utilize the NCI central IRB. Until just a few years ago, the VA could only use a VA or an affiliate university IRB, uh, but that has since changed. We can use the NCI central IRB, and we actually now have the ability to use commercial IRBs uh, with, the, with the proper uh, approvals. And a big thing, and this is something our committee does work on, is that a lot of veterans didn't qualify for these studies because of their various comorbidities. Um, it's one of my investigators at the university often said, you know, a lot of these studies just want to recruit movie stars. Just, you know, just people that are just, uh, don't have a lot of comorbidities. And that's certainly not our veteran population. Uh, renal disease, liver disease, a m number of other things. And uh, being a government agency, funding for staff and support would go up and down with various administrations and uh, what your local uh, medical center director might view as the most important thing to do that year, whether it's, you know, it had to focus completely on clinical care or they would allow some research. Recognizing this lack of involvement, uh, the forward-thinking Dr. Blanke uh, requested the formation of the VA working group. I you still haven't told me how you found my phone number. Uh, <laughs> but with, with the mission to improve uh, veteran access to high quality cancer care uh, by assisting local facilities in uh, opening and, and accruing to more trials. Uh, we had our first meeting in 2013. Uh, we have continued meetings at all our, our uh, fall and spring group meetings. And as expected, it, it took a while to get things going. Some of our early meetings were uh, very sparse. Um, there was just a few of us in the room. Uh, I might have been the only VA person. Uh, there was a lot of SWAG operations people. Uh, and that had a lot to do with funding, too, because of travel. You know, I just learned yesterday that the Hope Foundation funded five of our VA CRAs to come to this meeting. That vastly improves you know, the cooperation and communication we have uh, among our team. And uh, as somebody put it yesterday, uh, just found a bunch of new friends to work with. So, um, so the initial effort, and uh, this was alluded to as Maverick being uh, one of the top accruers, uh, with support from uh, Vision One leadership, and for those of you not in the VA, VISN stands for Veteran Integrated Service Network. There's small groups of medical centers within a, a geographical area um, that work together and have, have a, a director for them. Uh, so they developed a, a new model for uh, VA participation with a hub and spoke model, uh, which we call the storefront. So there's a storefront administrative site um, which is the primary SWAG member, and then the individual VA medical centers that are the spokes uh, contribute to that site. And so each of these smaller medical centers don't have to meet the accrual standards to be a full member, just the, uh, the administrative site. Um, also, the administrative site assists in identifying uh, protocols that uh, would be good for the VA population um, and provide some templates and assistance in, in getting uh, the protocols up and running by uh, developing uh, the documents that are needed for, for uh, approval. This is just a graphical representation of that. Um, and, and the storefront model is something uh, that, that obviously has worked really well if you look at the accrual. These are the current Maverick storefront sites. Uh, I believe originally, uh, the original Maverick storefront sites were all in the Northeast, but everybody wanted to be part of the storefront. And uh, there was a lot of 
uh, medical centers that ask, you know, can I be part of your storefront? Can I be part of your storefront? And, um, so they did add some others, Puget Sound, Loma Linda, Shreveport, Gainesville, uh, and Salisbury. So it's, it's um, a very popular model within VA. They did have to put a cap on it because they uh, couldn't do, add any more sites, which is kind of the reason we did one of uh, the HOPE Foundation grants I'll be talking about. Um, so one of the, based on some of what we learned from the storefront experience, um, we proposed as a working group at the time uh, what we call the VA integration grants. These are small grants uh, that were awarded annually for a period of a year, and they were designed to just give that little Kickstarter funding to a, a location to hire a CRA or pay additional time for a CRA, fill some kind of gap in that program to kind of get them moving forward. Um, we proposed this to the Hope Foundation and gladly they, they accepted this and over time, we tweaked it a little bit over time from uh, less money and more sites to uh, more money and fewer sites. But, over time, uh, it's worked, and between 2015 and 20, uh, 2021, we funded 21 sites, Hope Foundation has funded 21 sites for a grand total of $700,000, uh, which has uh, been a huge help. And a really important part of this is that this has become the template for what's called the Navigate program. Um, they have more money because they're, it's NCI and the VA now uh, uh, doing this. And, so what the Navigate program is, is uh, the NCI and VA interagency group to accelerate trials enrollment. So I don't know how long they worked on that acronym, but um, it took some time. Uh, so this is a collaboration between NCI and the VA, uh, opportunity for a couple of government agencies to work together. That actually does happen. Um, and it was enabled to sustain a long-term capability of uh, uh, participating sites to uh, get involved with clinical trials. Because they had more money, these grants are longer, a uh, large amount of money, so it's the one problem with our SWAG integration grants, they were for one year, and, and it was, you know, often hard to, uh, you know, move beyond that if, if they didn't get a whole lot of traction that first year. Um, and they establish an operation and consortium of VA sites on improving participation. So Navigate meets once a month. They have uh, conversations on how to do things, how to improve things, and that sort of stuff. Currently, there's 12 Navigate sites. Many of these Navigate sites were originally VA integration sites. So we take pride in kind of giving them uh, the, uh, the impetus to move forward. There's going to be four additional Navigate sites uh, announced, I believe, actually next month. And then um, as part of the Navigate review team, we did identify some additional opportunities through the Navigate review process of other things we can, we're going to try to use uh, within our SWAG committee. This is uh, Navigate versus non-Navigate VA enrollment. And there's, I think there's two important things to, to glean from this slide. One is that the cooperation really improved accrual. You look at the 12 Navigate sites, it was 800 patients versus 25 non-Navigate non sites, and it was 342. The other important thing is the VA population. They have, the Navigate sites were 22% black and 6% other unknown, and non-Navigate 19% black and 6% other unknown, versus the normal NCI, NCI trial, um, enrollment by race, which was only 8% black. So VA has a much more diverse population. Um, and if you want diversity in your trials, think about VA. That's really important. The other thing we did as a working group, we identified what we call the SWAG VA specialist. This is going to, it's a half-time position within uh, the Network Operations Center in San Antonio. Uh, I believe this is also funded by HOPE. And uh, we've had a couple of people in this position. And it, it helps as a single point of contact within SWAG for VAs to go to and say, you know, what do I need to do for this? Uh, what, what do I need to do to be a member? Who can I contact about this sort of thing? So you're not searching all over for, for the right contact. 
These are our current uh, SWAG VA sites. I believe there's a couple of more coming on board uh, fairly soon. Other programs that we have, because we, we do get the support from both uh, SWAG leadership and uh, the HOPE Foundation, uh, we have the SWAG VA workbench. This is uh, on the SWAG website. Number of documents that uh, can help uh, point local sites in the right direction and give them some key to what needs to be done. We have a community advocate. Uh, Bruce is our liaison for promoting clinical trials, uh, reviewing kind of some of the things we do to make sure that it fits with the, as a veteran himself, uh, fits with our population. And one of the important things that we've done recently, and we had a lot of evidence uh, yesterday for this in our committee meeting, was the SWAG Disease Committee liaisons. Um, we're identifying, and the next slide will show who we have right now. We identify VA investigators uh, that have an interest in particular diseases and ask that uh, volunteer to be uh, associated with a disease committee, and then we ask the disease committee chair if this is okay. But, but their role, and we're doing some work on improving um, how we uh, uh, teach our, not teach, but um, advise our uh, liaisons and chairs how to work together and things that, that will improve. The idea being that you have a VA person that knows the VA population on those disease committees. Um, and yesterday, our committee meeting, we had three, uh, actually four uh, uh, protocols presented. One of them was still in development and asking our group for input on you know, what would help accrue veteran patients to their studies. And, and I know uh, some investigators got a lot out of that. Uh, it was, you know, important information for them that might, you know, either tweak the current studies or some future studies. Um, these are our current reps. We have a couple pending as well. In spring 2022, we were granted full committee status. Um, so, uh, as it says, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, going from a working group to a committee was, uh, as we've identified in, in within some of the groups is there's kind of no manual for how to do this. Um, so you make it up as you go along, but it has kind of reinvigorated us, uh, gives us some additional opportunities and, and I guess leverage to, to move forward with some other um, uh, uh, programs. So with that, one of the things we did, we thought the VA integration uh, grant program it kind of run its course. Uh, we weren't getting as many applications when we did put those out. Um, some of them weren't as strong, but we knew the storefront model worked really well. And so we proposed to the Hope Foundation uh, last spring that, uh, or spring 2022, that uh, we changed the integration grant program to a storefront uh, grant. Uh, we were initially told that, uh, you know, we kind of missed the cycle and it wasn't going to happen until 2023 for funding in 2024. But I think you guys thought it was a good idea, and so you approved. Yeah. What? <laughs> so, so, so it surprised us and said, hey, you can do this now. We um, did the request for applications uh, the summer 2022 and the new storefront in South Texas was... Uh, approved in November of that year. This is uh, the storefront grant right now. Uh, missing from the hub uh, is the co-PI, Mike Liss. Um, and I think another important thing to notice about this, when we first approved this grant, it was uh, South Texas, San Antonio, Central Texas, and North Texas. But even after they got the grant, they went ahead and added Oklahoma City. So it's already growing even before uh, I think they got money. Other things we're doing, we have a SWAG program development team. We provide ideas to try to overcome some of the barriers that we see within VA or uh, uh, issues with you know, NCI versus VA and how to, how to smooth those uh, problems. Uh, develop proposals to shorten and simplify the VA process. 
Uh, we're working on improving our operational abilities to work in sync with new trial development, as I mentioned, with the uh, study committee or uh, disease committees. And um, we're going to develop some training for VA sites to uh, help with trial activation. So they, um, if a new CRA comes in and they really don't know, again, like it's a committee chair, they, there's no manual for this right now. We want to create the manual for this. Um, and we're going to develop a shared resource for studies and operations within the VA. Uh, we are going to work closely with the Navigate program with this, as well as our storefronts. Uh, instead of just siloing in each of these uh, groups, we're going to work together uh, so it, it's kind of one big happy family. So, uh, Recently, uh, last couple years, uh, we also participated in AVAHO, and this was uh, supported by the Hope Foundation. Uh, AVAHO is a, a group not within VA, it's actually outside of VA, but it's VA hematology and oncology professionals, um, and it, it's funded through, uh, it's kind of a nonprofit that's funded uh, through uh, grants and such. We've uh, had a booth the last couple of years with that, again, supported by Hope Foundation and sent uh, SWAG operations people to uh, highlight what we do in SWAG and uh, what, what we can do for VA. Uh, there's numerous contacts and initiatives that are, that are coming out of that, especially this last meeting. And finally, the acknowledgments. Um, I'd be remiss not to thank Dr. Blanke as being so forward thinking and setting up the VA committee. We are the only cooperative group that has a VA committee. There's others that have talked about it, but we're the only one that has proceeded forward and, and done this. Um, our program development committee, Sarah Schiller, who's unfortunately not with the VA anymore. She was uh, a prime moving force. I wish she was still with us because uh, it would be great. And, I'm not going to read all the names, but uh, also from uh, SWAG operations, I, I forgot to, Dana, to include you on it, but uh, she helps make, she gives our, our SWAG operations people the, the time and ability to work on our programs, which is, is very helpful to us. Because we do have that halftime person, but, you know, we have Connie and Sharon and Lacey and all these other folks that, that uh, have really taken a hold and, and helped us. Um, these are other folks on our development committee. We had a great development committee meeting this week and we've got a lot of ideas moving forward. Uh, the Maverick storefront, Dr. Brophy, Sarah, Stephanie Ferguson, who is now the current Navigate coordinator, Colleen Shannon and Corey. And then our, our Texas storefront group who uh, has, has taken this on and, and uh, hopefully we're going to have more to come from them in future meetings. And of course, Joe and Morgan. Uh, we couldn't do this without them. Uh, Morgan does such a great job keeping me in line when we do grants and stuff, and this is what you got to do, and this is where you find it. So um, I thank you so much, and we couldn't have gotten anywhere close to where we're at now without the support of SWAG leadership and the HOPE Foundation. Thank you. Thanks, David. I'm not entirely convinced how clever the um, NAVIGATE acronym really was, since it also is the name of 20 other programs in the NCI, but it is a great program, so please support it. In any case, I'm uh, very pleased to announce our next speaker, Dr. Patricia Robinson, professor of medicine at Loyola University. Dr. Robinson was the first recipient of a SWAG HOPE Career Development Award for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, our DEI fellowship, which she just completed. As I noted earlier, she continues to work with SWAG in this area, is a special advisor to our vice chair for DEII, Dr. Don Dizan. She's here today to share some of what she's learned about helping SWAG move into a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive future. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present the work that we did over the past two years. And in particular, Dr. Blanke, thank you so much for your unwavering support for DEI and to the Hope Foundation who provided funding. Nope. There we go. Okay, so I want to start by putting um, into context the work that was done. 
Most entities refer to diversity, equity, and inclusion from within the framework of workforce, but actually SWOG's initial work within the diversity space focused upon representativeness in clinical trials. So I just want to explain why this work was important. So I'm going to do a couple of slides at SWOG at a glance. So I'd like to thank Rick Banks and Catherine Guthrie for providing this information that I repurposed in the form of pie charts. So when looking at um, enrollment to clinical trials, SWOG clinical trials over a 10-year time period, on the left it illustrates what the U.S. population looks like by the most recent census data, but looking at SWOG, we can see that across all minority groups, we actually under-enroll patients relative to their prevalence in the U.S. population. When looking at ethnicity, we too under-enroll Hispanic patients relative to their prevalence in the U.S. population. In terms of gender, we all know that women uh, slightly outnumber men in the U.S. population, um, but interestingly, women might do a little bit better in terms of accrual on SWOG clinical trials, but it would be interesting to look at this data more granularly and tease out the breast cancer patients and just look at all other SWOG trials to see how women enrollment, um, what that looks like. When looking at age, again, this is just absolute numbers, and we see that the vast majority of SWOG patients are between the ages of 40 and 79, and that um, it's hypothesis generating to see whether or not we actually under-enroll patients in the elderly and AYA patient population. I'd like to paint a picture for you all. It's been commonly said that DEI is a journey and not a destination. So for those of you who played Candyland as a kid, or maybe more recently with your kids or grandchildren, you remember in that board game, the point is transitioning through Candyland. There wasn't a specific destination. There wasn't like a card where you got to go to the end of the game magically. Really, the whole game was designed to trans traverse through Candyland. So at the beginning of our journey, this is what the DEI space looked like. Through the leadership of Allison Caban Holt and the chair of the Patient and Advocate Committee, and Rick Bangs, the chair of the Retention, oh, excuse me, I did that in reverse. Rick Bangs, who was the chair of the Patient and Advocate Committee, and then Allison Caban Holt, who was the chair of the Recruitment and Retention Committee, they kind of were formative in terms of the spaces and the resources. So I came along as the DEI fellow, and then we onboarded DEI champions, and then we onboarded DEI monitoring committee members. We conducted a climate survey that indeed demonstrate that SWAG leadership was interested and supportive of DEI efforts. And then we conducted a current state analysis with the help of the statistical office that identified three areas in which SWAG could improve DEI work, including forecasting, accountability, and workflow. Module six was then pushed out, and module six really looked at um, strategies that could be applied to five stages of the life cycle of a clinical trial. And that included defining the question, reviewing it, um, refining study design, implementation, and then sharing and communication of the information. The red arrows um, reflect the areas in which the five DEI champions piloted in the following committees, lung, GI, GU, myeloma, and breast, were able to implement impact and or change. And that included building teams with diversity and representativeness. Analysis, and, sorry, analyzing portfolio and identifying gaps, developing preliminary forecasting of subpopulations with the help of the statisticians, review of inclusion and exclusion criteria, developing accrual plans, and then checking accrual progress and development uh, countermeasures. So going back to the current state analysis, as I said, over three facets, we were able to identify areas where DEI could have a meaningful impact. So using a red light, yellow light, and green line method, um, I just want to illustrate the things that were done or are work in progress. Green represents the things that we accomplished, yellow, work in progress, and yet has yet to be done and will probably be incorporated in this year's um, expansion of our work. So we were able to incorporate the DI champions to assist with study teams, analyzing portfolios, collaborating with the statisticians, identifying accountable persons for representativeness and forecast development, forming DEI teams within committees, and generating reports to SWOG leadership. 
Things that are in progress include reporting study enrollment relative to forecasted populations, analyzing data quarterly, documenting in the reported studies with intentionality, sharing best practices between committees, completing module six, examining inclusion and exclusion criteria, and things to be done include consider adaptive clinical trial design, creating networks and partnerships, developing and implementing countermeasures, and assessing broad applicability, applicability of trial results. I teased out from our year two annual report the experience of the DEI champions so you can all recognize the hard work uh, that was put in. In terms of, and this is by no means um, all that was done or mentioned in the annual report, but I did try to pull out some highlights. So the Lung Committee champion, Lucy Gansauer, was able to support revision of SWOG 2302 in terms of recruitment and revision plan for diverse populations and uh, improve site recruitment. Nicely, they were able to demonstrate an increased accrual of blacks on the lung map from approximately 9% in January of 2022 to 10% by December of that same year. The myeloma champion, which is Manuel Espinoza Gutara, uh, was able to develop a first-of-kind prospective multi-tiered recruitment strategy. And as mentioned by Dr. Blanke, we are all very proud of him of being one of the WIN CDA award recipients. The breast champion, uh, Gayathri Nagarajan, retrospectively identified missed opportunities addressing countermeasures. I believe her study was actually the responder, which has that great title that was mentioned earlier. The GI champion, Colmar Figueroa Mosley, developed a GI-specific recruitment and retention DEI rating form. And Jessica McDermott, the GI, excuse me, the GU champion, focused on creation of a permanent DEI structure allowing for the development of DEI initiatives during protocol design, site engagement, recruitment, and retention. And interestingly, there was strong momentum amongst many of the committees, and the GI and the GU were able to independently establish uh, DEI committees. So GI has a primary scientific committee, DEI physician champion, and GU established a uh, DEI lead. In terms of strengths presented as a modified SWOT analysis, some of the strengths included development of a DEI culture of leadership, development or engagement of subcommittees, module six, which provided a good stepwise way to review a study at multiple points, some weaknesses was that access to raw data to better understand progress or lack thereof. And then certainly cited opportunities would be developing synergistic relationships between committees, expanding our definition of diverse populations with intentionality. So now we look at what the DEI space looks like at the end of our uh, project. We now have a DEI vice chair, Don Dizon, who sits in the center. The DEI champions, that program will continue on. Recruitment and retention committees. DEI advisor, which is me uh, transitioning off. A, DD, a DEI leadership council. A patient advocate committee. And a DEI committee. Now, what's nice to note is that there are adjunct and or supportive features to this. For the first time, we had a DEI town hall. And for those of you who are not with us, it was standing room only. It was really a nice presentation by Dr. Christopher Cross, who joined us from ASCO, talking about their efforts and how we can work integratively. The DEI subcommittees formed, as I mentioned. The Take Action Symposium, which I recognize started um, before I came on board, but really is a great piece um, to the DEI space. And that is um, work effort from recruitment and retention committee. And then certainly we should acknowledge that the GU committee hosted a diversity, equity, and inclusion GU oncology symposium, I think two years ago, year and a half ago. So in terms of workforce, because that is a part of diversity and something that we'll be looking at at SWAG, diversity is no longer defined preliminarily by race, gender, race and gender but has broadened to include differences in cultural backgrounds, disabilities, geography, age, sexual orientation, race, and gender. So I'm gonna steal a theme from the NCI, which is the NCI guidelines request that you aim to have your cancer center membership 
represent the population of your catchment area, and your leadership represent the population of the nation. And really, I wanted to throw this in because I want SWAG to think about what is, what is diversity going to look like to us in terms of our membership, um, identifying gaps and needs, and well as what is this going to represent for our leadership. When looking at the workforce, we all recognize that we have a pipeline issue. And that exceeds race. It includes age. The median age of an oncologist engaged in patient care is 51. Those greater than or equal to age 64 comprise 22% of oncologists and outnumber the 13.3% of oncologists less than age 40. Nearly one-third of oncologists are women at 35%. In geography, 10% of oncologists practice in rural areas. The physician workforce continues to struggle with adequate representation of racial and ethnic minorities, with hematology and oncology lagging in medicine in general. Approximately 13% of the U.S. population is black or African American, and 18% is Hispanic. However, we only represent 2.3% of practicing oncologists and 5.8% respectively. When looking at leadership, this data comes from NCI um, designated cancer centers. You can see the vast majority of directors, associate directors, deputy directors, and research program leaders are non-Hispanic whites. And then lagging behind would be Asians, Hispanics, and non-Hispanics, other and American Indian. And it's not surprising that the vast majority of those positions are held by men across the board. I think that SWOG holds a very unique space at the intersection of health equity and workforce DEI. So in terms of representativeness in clinical trials, we have a significant ability to impact health equity and minimizing health disparities, but we also have uh, a role in career development, professional development, and leadership in terms of SWAG and our members. So in terms of next steps, Next steps for me, I will be um, helping to create a real-time dashboard of patient accruals, and you will be able to look at SWOG's data as well as your own institutional data. So it allows you more in a real time to implement countermeasures if the um, clinical trial or your site is not performing up to what you forecasted, and uh, developing a protocol DEI checklist, which will hopefully help in the protocol development setting. Also in production is the SWOG membership dashboard. We don't know what we want to be or what we need to be without knowing where we are, and that is under the leadership of, of Rick Bangs. So in terms of goals, I want to go back to that Candyland game that I mentioned before. So obviously the fun in the game is just getting through it, but it was equally as fun when you picked up the card and you got Gumdrop Mountain or you got Candy Cane Forest. Those are destinations. So I'm not no, so naive to think that diversity or DEI is just a journey. There actually are some benchmarks or some metrics or some landing spaces that we need to have. So some of these goals are increasing the diversity of the cancer research workforce, building a more inclusive and equitable community, addressing cancer disparities and advanced health equity within the context of clinical trials. So the first two years of my work, uh, my buzzword was intentional. I wanted all of the things that we did and our thought processes to be very intentional. And the next year of my work, my buzzword is going to be integrative. And that's because the village that we have constructed needs to work more collaboratively and more integratively to have successful endpoints and develop the metrics so that um, all benchmarks can be made. So thank you very much. And I want to acknowledge the people on this slide in, it's in alphabetical order. <laughs> Rick Bangs, Don Dizan, Lucy Gensauer, Manuel Ricardo Espinoza Guitar, Allison Cabin Holt, Jessica McDermott, Colmar Figueroa Mosley, uh, Guthrie Nagarajan. And the last person I should probably add is Catherine Guthrie. Thank you so much for your support and statistical input. And thank you, that was lovely. So our final and keynote speaker, Joe Horan, requires no introduction in this room, but for the record, she is president and CEO of the Hope Foundation for Cancer Research. Today, she'll help us celebrate Hope's 30 years of impact by providing her perspective on the organization, 
and its support for SWAG research, past, present, and future. Take it away. <sighs> I was going to come up here and make a joke, but in all honesty, I'm sort of at a loss for words. Um, and you know what I'm reflecting on at this moment is what a privilege it is to be able to feel proud about our work and appreciated and um, just for the capacity. And you know, that pride isn't mine. My name comes up all the time and the Hope comes up all the time because it's actually your work. So I think I'd love to turn the lens and just thank you and appreciate you and tell you that I am proud of each and every one of you. So thanks. It's also going to be, I was really emotional. Virginia almost made me cry. Uh, so if I cry up here, forgive me. I'm also a human, right? We're all humans experiencing this together. So let's see if I can drive this. What do, what do I press? I have no disclosures. Uh, so I do want to also begin with a, a public recognition and a thank you to the Hope Foundation Board of Directors. Uh, our current board, we had a few shifts uh, this uh, week as folks termed off, but to the current group, thank you. To those who are newly elected, welcome and thank you. And to um, my new group of bosses, thank you. You're the best. I appreciate you. Uh, I look forward to what we all have in store. Uh, the second thing I want to do is show you this and also call out Morgan Cox yet again uh, because she's fantastic and has worked so hard. This is a beautiful, beautiful historical narrative of the work of Hope and Swag. Um, please go pick one up. I would prefer that you not read it while I am speaking, but you can read it right afterwards. <laughs> And I think my, you know, my talk, really what we're doing is framing out much of what is covered in this beautiful um, production to celebrate our 30th year, because that is a really big deal, and that too is not lost on me. So what do we mean when we talk about a generation? Uh, we mean 30 years of generating momentum for SWAG. We mean 30 years of helping members generate good ideas, improving patient care, we mean 30 years of generating funding, dollars, to move SWAG's mission forward. We also mean that we are a generation, right? There's the leaders of yesterday, those in front of us, and the leaders of tomorrow. And the Hope Foundation really strives to provide a bridge between those generations where we can support, provide opportunity, and build the trust, which is really necessary to make any gains in this fight against cancer. And we mean just 30 years. Like, wow, that's, that's a long time. And so, so much has happened. So at the beginning, I promise this talk isn't about me, uh, but I really like to talk about myself, so I couldn't help it. Uh, I, I want to take a moment and tell you how I became a part of this uh, incredible generation of SWAG work and how in the mere half generation that I've been around, I've really had uh, the opportunity to watch the Hope and Swag intersection come alive. I was lucky enough to sit at a table with Chuck Coltman and Marge Godfrey, lucky enough to get my bearings with the help of Dana Sparks and Connie Barnes and the fiercely loyal teams that honestly hold this group up. So I want to take a moment and from the podium make sure that we appreciate all of the folks who work for each of us and all of our patients. So if you could join me in a round of applause for that group of people. Uh, so I can recall, it was, my, it was my first group meeting. I think it was 2006, I know it was in Utah. And I remember being sort of puzzled and wondering about this fast talking, fast walking guy who had an infant carrier. And it turned out to be a little bit of a younger version of Dr. Blanke. It's the first, first SWAG member that I identified. Um, and it's really been a privilege. You know, I've watched the Hope Foundation team grow from two to 52 team members, and from three to $63 million in assets. And that has been a remarkable experience professionally, for sure. Um, but more life-changing and frankly, far more important is how I've also had the experience of watching how Hope and SWAG actually change lives. 
So if you know me, I don't get in the business of science. But uh, this is a, a slide that I stole from um, Dr. Vashampayan Elka, if you're here, I apologize. It was publicly available on the internet. Uh, it's an accrual slide, obviously, of the probe trial, which is SO931. And this trial received HOPE support for um, education and patient accrual initiatives. And uh, specifically, we worked with the study team to create some really great patient-facing videos. Right? It's a tough trial to accrue to. The randomization is really invasive, honestly. It's a nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy um, versus standard of care. So we ask a lot, right? Let's also take a moment to recognize how much we ask of patient volunteers on our trials, right? So I was in the session, and this is in the spring of 2022, obviously GU. And I'm watching this slide, and I had this experience that essentially was like breaking down the fourth wall. And I share this because I know that um, Many of you probably also can relate. But here I am, and I noticed that there's one single accrual in February 2022. And we you know, got involved with accrual for this trial because it was tough. It was, it was a rough start to get patients to join. And so I was looking. It's a national trial, right? It's all over the country opening up. And that February 2022, trial is that accrual is my husband, right? So just watching that, and I didn't expect to get emotional because at this point it's kind of robotic, um, but that was his accrual, which is so strange, right? And I think that um, it was also the patient videos that came to my house he watched that Hope funded, right? And seeing how those videos actually informed his decision to join the trial which he honestly, I just took myself out of it because it wasn't my business and I was conflicted. <laughs> um, he didn't want to join it, right? Because it's a lot to ask somebody to suddenly have their kidney removed at the roll of a dice. So um, that video helped him to know the right thing for him to do was to join. And what an amazing validation that was of our work. Um, and so I see it, I know, I know that this generation of trusted colleagues of hope money, of good ideas, really changes lives. So I'm just I'm going to go back to inception, and um, I won't make this about me anymore, but we're definitely skewing in that direction at this point, so I'm going to, I'm going to bring it home. Um, although I will say this is a picture of, of uh, Dr. Baker and I at my wedding, so that's, uh, that's the last one you'll see. Um, but let's go back to inception. So in 1993, Dr. Coltman and a close-knit team of SWOG leaders established the Hope Foundation, which was uh, then known as the SWOG Foundation. And the goal was really to leverage funds to subsidize SWOG research. Um, Keystone programs that you've heard about countless times today, the early stage investigator course, um, were highly successful. And accoutrements, perhaps someone in this room remembers uh, the group meeting shrimp cocktail, were also highly popular. Hope was, was really well positioned in its first decade. So Dr. Baker was elected to SWOG in 2004, and he moved the foundation to Michigan in 2005, which was my uh, jumping on point. I'm from Michigan. And he was, I say this with respect, uh, unabashedly opinionated and progressive, and he had decades of involvement in SWOG before he became chair. Um, so he fought with a few or many, depending on who you were, uh, and advocated really tirelessly for charitable funding for the foundation from our increasingly interwoven collaborations uh, with pharma. And really, he helped us to build a deliberate framework that would scaffold incredible changes for how SWO uh, HOPE and SWAG function together. And then we enter this period of acceleration, right? So here you see industry support um, from 2006 to 2012. Um, really, what sticks out here to me is that in 2011, we marked the first time we offered peer-reviewed funding opportunities. So we offered three grants, right? And what that essentially means is um, we gave opportunity to sites across the country to apply for our funding. This continued to build in 2012, 
And again, I think what this really does is marks an era, ushers in an era of accessibility, of transparency, of growth within the Hope Foundation so that the foundation itself really became um, open to all members of this group. And hopefully, with acceleration comes expansion. So here, you know, there's a, there's a ton of programs. Please see the website. Uh, these are a couple of our hallmark programs. And um, we continued to grow and grow, and we did so intelligently, thanks to the invaluable guidance and friendship of leaders like Ann Schott, Don Hirschman, and Chuck Blanke. Um, at current, the foundation has nine peer-reviewed programs that we offer every year, sometimes twice a year. And we also have seven additional programs that fund meetings and membership needs. Um, a metric that sort of astounded me. It's funny, when you're inside something every day, you don't really step back and look at the, the impact. But since the Impact Award started, with our peer-reviewed funding programs at HOPE, we have channeled over 17 and a quarter million dollars to SWAG research in the period of time you saw on that last slide which is an impressive accomplishment. So if everybody's smart and open, after uh, accelerating and expanding, you can integrate. So I often think about how, you know, I used to talk about Hope, it was sort of this like sidecar to Suave, and now truly it's become absolutely a working part of how SWAG does business. We consider ourselves internally as part of our core office engagement with SWAG. But to give you some examples of this integration, I think you heard about um, the million dollar uh, gift to the VA that's happened over the course of these years that's become seminal to SWAG work. Uh, we've pledged over a million dollars to the Statistical Center to address the increasingly complex needs of stats I'm also super proud to report that the board just the other day approved an additional $1.4 million to fund the Stat Center. So it's there, it's counting, it's absolutely making a difference for how SWAG does business. Um, you know, other interesting stats, we've had 36 early stage investigators go through the virtual grant writing course. I will tell you, their return on um, positive grant response is absurd. It's a free course, it's open to the entire NCTN. And uh, Dr. Crew, shout out to wherever you are, but she leads that course and has developed that course from the beginning. It's an exceptional opportunity. Uh, we've also funded 82 CRAs and nurses to attend SWOG meetings, and those are from sites that otherwise just don't have the bank to send them here. And so we seriously consider it our job to make sure that our membership can be here and be represented. And I'm gonna go through these more quickly because they did a far better job than I ever could. Um, but we can, when we consider a generation of integrated uh, support of SWAG at HOPE, there's three buckets. There's membership support, there's site support, and there's trial participant support. So you heard, you heard it from the queen herself. Uh, Dr. Sun is a shining example. She is our poster child of SWAG's mission to provide a continuum of career support to SWAG investigators, right? She uh, has uh, went through the early stage investigator course. She's, you saw, won multiple grants. She's led her own research team. She's reviewed for HOPE. She is now an executive officer of SWAG and also assuming leadership positions in her home institution while consistently being part of this group. You know, the list of other members who have had that sort of career support through their stages would be long. Um, which is extremely, I'm extremely proud to report, but when we look, you know, just on this slide, Kathy Crew, Jason Zell, Lynn Henry, those are members who all started at the early stage investigator course, have received funding, have led trials, are now leaders, right? That's a pretty awesome equation. Uh, and I also wanna call out and celebrate members like Dr. Rosa Rojavan. Ray has been uh, just finished up his second term as the HOPE board chair. I'm eternally in, in, uh, indebted to his leadership and his friendship. Um, Lynn and Jason, actually on this slide, have also been on the HOPE board. And I wanna be sure we continue to celebrate members like Ian Thompson, Frank Maskins, Dana Sparks, and Bill Bar Barlow, who have been building their legacies by giving back to SWAG through the HOPE Foundation for many, many, many years. 
So as for supportive sites in this integrated generation of funding, um, you know, Steve did a far better job at telling you how we've impacted the VA uh, and patients served by the VA across the country. I think each of these points on this map, to me, represent a site striving to connect veterans to trials, which is a really obviously critical step. The other thing that jumps out to me about this slide is that the sites are all around the country, right? We do not concentrate funding around academic centers. We are intentional about where and how we fund our work. And this is important, right? Because hope truly is for each and every one of us. Even Hawaii and Guam, who are not on this map, and I apologize because that must happen all the time, um, but our SEED and NCORP pilot programs are bringing trials to rural patients in Hawaii. Uh, the Advanced Practice Provider Initiative was born there as well as in Kansas. Um, you really see the geographic strength of the cooperative groups. Plain language trial summaries provided to sites are another way the foundation provides uh, funding for support. Those trial summaries are now translated into Spanish. And I think it's been mentioned a number of times over that we provide tons of travel support to ensure that CRAs, data managers, nurses, PIs, junior fellows, name the person on the list, can get here to collaborate, to learn, to grow, and to be a part of this amazing group. Finally, but we all can agree the most importantly, um, we strive to better support patients. And Patricia Robinson is obviously a key figure in our efforts to broaden SWOG study accrual, to connect with diverse patient populations, and to ultimately improve patient care. Key partnerships that the foundation has um, built with funding partners, particularly like Genentech, to enable much of this work has really allowed us to change the culture of how this network functions. They've also helped create a new role. Um, Don Dizan is leading today to keep equity uh, at the heart of our mission, but also at our leadership, um, which matters. And we've been enabled to do outreach via the community advocates, uh, as well as the DEI champions that you've heard about. So those, thanks to Rick Bangs again and again, those are projects which really help us to ultimately have an impact on the patients that we were looking to treat. So I'm excited, right? This is the next generation. And it's, it's wonderful to envision how collectively, uh, what that looks like. The board approved just the other day a $3.4 million grants budget for SWAG next year, which is uh, amazing. Dr. Albain and Casey Dawson and Nathan Erickson and the entire SWAG CTP team is making huge scientific strides when it comes to SWAG CTP trials. The network operations group in San Antonio and Portland are killing it. They're committed, they're fierce, they're present. Um, and then our new SWAG co-chair elects, perhaps a bit you know, farther onto the horizon <laughs> at this point, um, but they are primed with us to come into this next generation. So come with us, right? We want your ideas. We want your suggestions for improvement. And of course, we want your buy-in and your financial donation. <laughs> so we are all, uh, as we have seen in this plenary many, many times over, connected in this generation of SWOG and HOPE cancer research in a huge way. But let's go even huger. So we look forward to it. Thanks so much. All right, uh, in the interest of time and given the crispness of presentations, we're not going to do any questions. I encourage you to reach out to our speakers, maybe at the cocktail party tonight or by email or whatever you see them at this meeting. So Joe couldn't think of a joke, but perhaps not surprisingly, all of this talk of hope reminds me of an amusing story that was just relayed to me by one of our very own SWAG members, Mary X. And it's really timely, given the $1.73 billion Powerball prize that came out last Wednesday. So it seems that for 45 years, Mary began her mornings exactly the same way. She would say, oh, Heavenly Father, please let me win the lottery today. I'll give a quarter of the money to the food bank, a quarter to a houseless shelter, a quarter to hope, and the very small remainder will see me through to the end of my days. 
Night after night, those little balls were drawn, and Mary won a whole lot of nothing. So frustrated, her prayer had not been answered after more than four decades, she finally lost it. She shouted out, God, why have you forsaken me? Are you even listening? And to her surprise, a booming voice answered. It said, Mary, meet me halfway here, at least buy a ticket. <laughs> eh, all right, fine. But true to her word, she did buy a ticket, and she did win. The problem was it was just a $4 scratch off. <laughs> all right, fine, no more hissing. As you leave the auditorium, please remember you can learn more about Hope's history at the kiosk in the lobby and see that Generation of Hope book that Joe told you about available at the Hope table. Thank you so much for what you do. I look forward to seeing you at today's reception. I tried.